Hello everybody and welcome to, well honestly something which I was quite happy to see because it's a nice way to start off the year. Top 5 inventions that came too late and it's this is for the 5th of January 2023. And I'm wearing suitable for your inventions. I'm wearing how to build a snowman as a t-shirt so if you want to see it closer up on this one, because usually I do get asked. There you go. How to build a snowman on a t-shirt. It's important because next week I'm basically doing the um, post-Christmas annual trip to various places to make sure they got presents and all sorts of things. So, um, yeah, it's this week, next week for me, it's buzzing around backwards, forwards, all over the place, driving like anything. Gonna wish I had a few of the inventions and I'm mentioning this. So I'm trying to get all these videos recorded this week because I'm going to have even less time next week. So wish me luck. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, the reason I laughed is because someone just... Michael Cooch, actually, just put this message in. Read a theory about a sloop reproducing due to excess stores. Could we do a scientific test by loading up HMS Gannett? I do not see why not. Let's see if we can't do that. Unfortunately, that is not one of going to be one of the actual things discussed in the invention series. The idea of a self-reproducing sloop. But I am going to start off with a shameless plug because, as I mentioned in other videos, I am planning to use this year to grow the channel, to grow my public-facing history stuff, because I think it's an important side of his part of history. For those who don't know, basically, a few years ago, what I would have called, and quite a few of the previous and a few generations before that, would have called just being a normal historian, I, you do speak to academia as well as speaking to the public, got hived off in that uh, now, if you um, talk to the public, you're a public-facing historian, which is terribly novo, and um, kind of... I wouldn't say looked down on. I wouldn't go that far. I would say looked at as being a bit strange, and why would you want to do that? It's, it's terribly, terribly inconvenient. And it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult to explain how much of an impact you have by being a public-focused uh, historian, whereas, you know, if you just focus on writing for journal articles, etc., we know how we then have the research impact metrics, which we can put in... Uh, the various frameworks which are used to judge university status. And um, we can get money from the government. So being a public-facing historian, doing this stuff, is not really that helpful. So, I am responding to that by uh, cranking up production, even trying to do some of my own Kindle books this year, which means I'm going to have to do a lot of travelling around the country to do research. I'm going to have to do a lot of stuff which is going to be organising, getting photos, all those things. And, um, yeah, I am 100% supported by all of you. I don't get funding from the government, or anyone, really. I get my paychecks from various teaching posts when those play institutions remember to remember, uh, remember to remember that they actually have contract staff and they need to pay them. But you know, it's academia. What do you expect? So I have this book, which is Out with Pen and Sword or USNI, able to be found in all good bookstores. Actually, no, I, I tell a lie. I haven't found it in a single bookstore. I have been looking. Me and Waterstones have had a long and appreciative relationship. The manager at Waterstones in my local Waterstones is currently hiding from my mother because every time she sees her when she come, uh, when they go, uh, when she goes down the town, she gets cross-examined as to when my book's going to be in the local bookstore. Um, seriously, that 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 woman has the patience of a. Both of them have far too much patience. We'll leave that to one side. And, of course, I have my little spreadsheet saw, where you can get things like this for your dog, as 
This isn't, of course, one of the fluffy research assistants, but that's because they won't allow me to upload the pictures I have of the fluffy research assistants wearing them, which I think would be far better. But I will possibly do put one of those up on a stream at some point. But no, that all is what Hal supported. Anyway, today's topic for top five mentions that came too late. Well, starting off with the 2000 horsepower engines. Now, here is the interesting thing. These were kind of strange in their commissioning. In that these 2000 horsepower engines were the first engines which were really commissioned, led by the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy was told it was going to get the fleet air arm back in 1937. And it was going to get them back, uh, them back in 1939. That was the Inskip decision. They'd been campaigning for it. And immediately, very, very quickly, the first thing the third seal all the time, Henderson, goes around order, orders and organizes. Remember, this is a guy who's been going around shipyards, ordering armor, plate, all sort of things, since 1933. Go, turns around to the end of mystery and goes, so, where's the next generation of engines? And I go, well, we've got these 1,000 horsepower engines, which are really good, and we're really refining them, because we are focused on the multi-engine bomber. And he had a turn around and had a chat, a contact with Fighter Command and went, what's going on? And Fighter Command went, we can't even get any money out of them, let's be honest, the Air Ministry ignore us as well. They, you know, they only just about remembered us now that we exist and they're giving us new fighters, but basically these engines are what we're getting. These are the engines they put multiples of in a bomber. Well, that's no use for me. I can't put multiple engines in my aircraft on my carriers. They're no help. No help at all. So the Royal Navy goes and orders them. Now, what's really strange, if you go through the various practices that are supposed to go on, honestly, the Air Ministry, if they'd gone by their schedule, would have been ordering them in 1938 anyway. They'd have been probably looking for new engines about that point. So they get ordered a year early by the Royal Navy. And the trouble is, their first flight, a uh, first run for uh, Navy of Sabre is January 1938. Uh, first one for Rolls Royce Griffin is November 1939. And basically, they get held up by World War II, which causes everyone to focus on the engines that are already building, refining them as much as possible because they've already got the production process going. So you try and make the thing you're producing as good as you possibly can do, because if you change production to a different engine, there is going to be a break. Not only that, you're going to need to redesign airframes, everything to take the new engine. So here is the point. It's because of this that we A, have the limitations we have on the fights we do. But also, if we consider the fleet air arm aircraft, if the 2000 horsepower engine had been available in 1938, i.e. in production, which if you canted it all back a year earlier, they would have been, the Royal Navy would have probably been fielding an, a fleet air arm which was mostly powered by Sabres. Maybe Griffins, but probably Sabres, because the reason they'd have gone that is the Air Ministry was really, really keen on taking everything from Rolls-Royce. And the moment the Griffin even starts to percolate around, the Air Ministry goes, <gasps> That also does perhaps mean, by the way, that instead of the Merlin being the engine and the sound of freedom, we end up with the far more chuggering Griffin being the sound of freedom. But you also then could potentially have had, I don't know, ME-109s and Fokker Wolves taking on Spitfires powered by 2,000 horsepower plus Rolls-Royce Griffins. I'm I'm just saying in 1913 and 1939-40, uh, I I'm just saying that might have led to a slightly different environment. I'm fairly sure hurricanes with that amount of power would have led to a slightly different environment. It would have led to a very different air war, especially when you suddenly put two of those engines in a mosquito and watch what happens. Um, I think that might well have been the, the first self-incinerating aircraft just due to airspeed. But leaving that to one side, 2,000 horsepower engines. Yes, they come into service by the end of the war. Yes, they're incredibly useful when they do come into service, and they are essential when they do come into service. But 
the Royal Navy was planning on fielding a fleet air arm entirely powered by the, this sort of level of engines. That's what they were looking at. 2,000 horsepower engines. That makes sense of a lot of their designs. A lot of those aircraft suddenly look a lot better once you've got more power in them. The power to weight ratio changes. I did a whole section of that in my PhD thesis because the power to weight ratio for aircraft performance is pretty darn critical in this period. Especially for naval aircraft because they have to carry so much extra stuff. So they're quite solid. So you therefore need the not necessarily the greater power in terms of miles per hour it gives you, but you need the greater power in terms of oomph that gets everything going and everything up to speed as quickly as you can when you're taking off to give you enough lift to take off with all that weight. Even if you do have accelerators, as they're called, catapults as they're called today, the oomph matters. And also, then you sort of think about it, if these engines have been available, then the Fairy Barracuda probably enters service on time. And we probably don't have Swordfish, Al Swordfish Albacore, we probably have Swordfish Barracuda, or maybe the Barracuda is called the Albacore. I'm not sure what. Um, we probably have some kind of naval fighter. And again, if it's a 2,000 horsepower engine aircraft, Sea hur uh, Hurricane, even, that is going to be a far better fighter for ships to have, for carriers, than the original of the version they actually get, even if it is worn out. So, there are some, and let's put it this way, both Hurricane and, Su uh, both Hawker and Supermarine were quite happily taking part in that composition for a naval fighter, so... Again, it's one of those things of, if this engine is available sooner, then the Royal Navy gets involved in the production sooner. And seeing as the RAF wants something which is rough, strip capable, the odds are maybe a naval variant goes for it. One of the reasons why the Royal Navy fighter project is canned is because the Royal Navy were insisting on getting a new engine for it. They wanted a 2,000 horsepower engine. They wanted let's be honest, a gullwing Spitfire with that engine, that one, the Napier Sabre, to operate from their carriers. Now, before we get into that, let's just think about what that would have done to anyone who came across it. Let's just think about this. A gullwinged Spitfire powered by a Napier Sabre engine. If you come from a nation which is descended from one of the Axis powers, and you are currently imagining that is not a place you would like your forebears to have been in front of said aircraft, I understand you. But I am also similarly worried about the number of my forebears who had been flying such aircraft. I lost three uncles. Three great uncles in the fleet air on World War II. They're what the three seagulls on the front of the book represent. I lost three of them. I know what's in my gene pool. I know how nutty I am. If you gave me that much power in a gullwing seafar, goodness gracious me the things I'd be doing in it. I mean, literally, I would probably find out what space tasted like. Because that thing could go up high and fast. Goodness gracious, and if I was diving... I might, you know, actually recreate something akin to the parting of the waves with sheer air pressure alone as I'm coming down. I'm just thinking it through. I'm not being blasphemous. I'm just thinking through the possibilities of what I could create with it. Okay? So, 2,000 horsepower engines. Yes, they entered service, but too late for us to have what they could have been. 4.5 inch dual purpose. Well, as they're fitted on the Daring's is as they wanted them. And if they'd had an upper deck mount, they could have fitted them to the C-Class uh, C class cruisers, the D-Class cruisers, the Tribal-Class destroyers. Pretty much every destroyer going could have had them. The Battle Class have to be completely rebuilt to be designed with between-deck mounts, which are the ones put on carriers and battleships. This is a truly dual-purpose weapon. We did a whole thing, and I've done a whole video... 
about the 4.7 inch if it had been truly dual purpose what it would have been capable of doing and how useful it would have been and I cannot overstate how useful it would have been but and this I mean in the nicest possible way it is not necessarily the 4.7 inch or the 4.5 inch which would have been the difference it's having the dual purpose gun which would have made a difference it would have made a tremendous difference to the air war in Norway it would have made a tremendous difference to the losses in the Mediterranean it would have made a tremendous difference to losses all the way around and at a certain point these things start to add up because if you lose less ships on your side and take out more pilots on the other side or even just cause more pilots to be lost through emotional trauma it has an effect it has an effect We can't be 100% sure what that effect is. I would love to say we, uh, you know, you can you can predict what this it will all add up to, but it's going to have an effect. Saying that. Would the effect necessarily have been positive? That is the other thing you have to think about. It, I think it would have been a positive effect. I think it would have been useful for the Royal Navy. It would have been useful short term. But longer term, the Axis forces would have, would have responded. If the Royal Navy has a better dual purpose weapon, which is costing them pilots in the Mediterranean in Norway, which is stopping them building up the anti-ship capability and experience there, that they use, which might also have an impact not just on the Norway campaign itself, well, probably more on the extraction than the actual um, overall campaign and the losses of ships, etc. But the whole thing cumulatively could have an impact on the Mediterranean campaign because if the Royal Navy ships take less casualties at Crete, etc., there's all sorts of operations which start to open up as being possible. Convoys start to be slightly more secure as air attacks wear slightly less. But one of the things I do think you probably see is Axis respond with things like, well, to be honest, they, their guide and their glide bombs and guided weapons are probably going to come about earlier because that's the sensible response to it. I will not scream. I will not scream. But this story makes my blood boil. Okay. The Royal Navy wasn't really surprised. It, it, there is often a debate as to whether or not the RAF altered the map, etc., to try and move things closer to them or look closer. I don't think they altered the map. I think they used a different projection. Because if you think about all the different map projections there are and ways to lay out the Earth, you can make things look closer without actually changing them. And you can make it look like, oh, yeah, this is, this is, this is close. We're, not, we're using this map today. And yes, it's perfectly honest, we haven't done any changes to the map. We've just picked the map which best suits our argument. And their argument was that Shackletons, they're Shackletons. And let's be honest, a Shackleton is not that, that far removed from a Lancaster bomber, really. In fact, honestly, Diavro Shackleton... Well, it's developed from the Lincoln, which is developed from the Lancaster. So it's two steps removed from a Lancaster. And unsurprisingly, they couldn't provide cover all the way around the world in terms of airborne early warning. Their tornadoes couldn't provide air defense to the fleet all around the world in terms of air defense either. They could in the primary theater, but this is the trouble. When you're trying to retain capabilities for outside out of theater operations and this is a classic thing they 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 say they're doing going to do out of theater operations outside of nato area operations 
but they haven't retained the capability which is required for it, which is airborne early warning. And the fact that they managed to get two aircraft converted and in service within 11 weeks, 11 weeks, 77 days, shows me A, this is not a particularly difficult task, and B, there is no good earthly reason for why they didn't manage to conduct it and carry it out and to put it in place in the preceding four years. And every life lost aboard a ship, I would argue, every single life lost, every single person lost aboard a ship in terms of the sea war, was lost because of that decision. Because if you had airborne early warning, you would not have had what happened to the Type 42s that were down there. You would not have happened what had what happened to the frigates down there, which were attacked. Maybe Exocets would still got through. Missiles will still be missiles. But bomb attacks and the aircraft getting close enough to do that, I highly doubt it. The Sea Harrier was a very good fighter, and armed with the Sidewinder missile, was very capable of knocking him out of the sky. The thing was, it was usually playing catch-up, because where was it getting its information from? And we all know, ship-based radar, as good as it is, if you go nap of the earth, or rather nap of the sea, and fly as low as you can, and come up behind land, and then bump up over land and attack... It's not going to be able to see you because it cannot see around the earth and it cannot see through large objects of land. But guess what? If you'd had one of these, you would have been able to see them coming. You could have started putting a cat forward. You could have put things forward. You could have operated the carriers further up threat. Again, something which Sandy Woodward gets... Can, gets a lot of flack for, which I don't agree with, is him operating the carriers where he is. And people go, well, you know, you could have operated, you'd have operated these carriers, that carriers. Kind of you wouldn't have without airborne early warning. No one would have operated those carriers anywhere closer than he was operating them without airborne early warning. But the moment you have these in service, you can do that. The moment you have these available, and before you start thinking, oh, it's got to be a lot of aircraft. It's 16 airframes. Okay, that wouldn't have been an excessive number, considering the number of Sea Kings the Royal Navy was already buying for anti-submarine warfare operations. And would it have been useful in the primary theatre of operations? Oh, yeah. I think having these in Norway in a northern campaign would have been very useful. There is literally no situation where having more airborne early warning is not useful. And you can point out they're helicopter based. They're not as good as um, Hawkeye. And I'm not going to sit there and claim otherwise. But for a carrier which can't carry a Hawkeye, if you want me to have the choice of nothing or this, which is a 70% solution vis a vis a Hawkeye, I will look at you as if you're insane for even making that an option. It's go for this. There is no choice. You go for this. It's 11 weeks. That's 11 weeks too late. That's my well, no, To my mind, that's four years too late. It's a very simple thing. You need airborne early warning in modern warfare. If space-based warning systems could offer real time, maybe you could get away without it. Maybe if you could guarantee your satellite was coverage was going to be overhead... 360 degree coverage, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, wherever your task group is in the in the world, then yeah, that cut that replaces it. But that's space based early warning instead of airborne early warning. It's still the providing the same thing, which is radar looking down, so you can't hide behind land. You can't hide in the map of the earth behind the horizon. And let's put it this way. Every ship attack, every attack by aircraft, even the Exocet ones, even those on Atlantic Cover, etc. If you've got Sea Kings with airborne early warning up, and if you've got two carriers down there, that means you probably would have six to eight aircraft 
which means you could probably guarantee three to four in the air at any one time. And you might well have taken some more down with you if you had an air, uh, if you had a full group of 16 available. So what, you might well have snuck some down and put some base them forward on the Falklands itself. So you can have a couple of airframes operating off the Falklands, flapping up in there from the FOB, and the others operating off the carriers, and you'd be amazed at how good a quality coverage you'd have. And the Argentinians wouldn't have got through, and it would have changed the scenario. Because suddenly all those systems, which the Royal Navy has, which are designed for operating in the North Atlantic and dealing with threats in the North Atlantic, and are therefore in a permanent state of shock when things come over a mountain at them, would be prepped and going, we know where you're coming, we know where you're coming, and ready, and aim, and fire. And suddenly all the missiles and all the guns would have been far more effective because they'd have known where the threat was coming from. And yes, I'm sure the Argentinians wouldn't have been dumb. I'm sure they'd have tried to spoof them and do a few other things. And who knows, those might have succeeded once or twice. But the thing is, they'd have had to do extra effort to do it. And again, they'd have lost a lot more pilots, a lot more aircraft, a lot more quickly. And that would add up to their, to their attrition of the operation and might make such things less likely. It might have ultimately saved not just British lives, but Argentinian lives by ending the war more quickly. Would have saved treasure, would have saved lives. There is literally no downside, and it took 11 weeks, which shows how technologically possible it was. I'm not saying it was easy, but I'm saying with a child, if you've got four years, you should be able to develop something which you can develop in 11 weeks when you have to. And here we have something which is kind of interesting to me. Hovercraft, or rather air cushioned vehicles, have been around a lot longer than people sometimes presume. In fact, there have been concepts around since the Swedish scientist Emanuel Swedenborg in 1716 put together some ideas. In Britain, John Isaac Thornycroft, yes, that's gentleman, patented a design for an air cushion ship hovercraft in the 1870s. Unfortunately, suitable, powerful engines were not available until the 20th century. Now, in 1915, Dagobert Müller von Fomerhall, who lived 1880 to 1986, built the world's first air cushion boat, the Luftkissenboot, which looked more like an aerofoil, really. It was propelled by four aero air engines, driving two submerged marine propellers and a fifth engine with that blew air under the front of the craft to increase the air pressure under it. Only when in motion could the aircraft trap air, air under the uh, trap air, and lift it. It trapped the air on the front and let that helped it lift up and it basically it allows it to ride more smoothly and more quickly and avoid friction so it's faster. The thing is in 1929 there's Andrew Kutcher at Ford doing his various experiments. There's also Charles Fletcher who's an, another American engineer who invents the, this glider mobile. Uh, there's a Finnish air engineer Tovio Karo who's developing a vessel in 1937, but thanks to basically World War, well, the Soviet invasion of Finland more than anything, he lacks the support to build it. Same in the Soviet Union, Vladimir Lekovnov designed several Clark craft in the 1930s, World War II put an end to development work. Ford was still playing around with it into the 1950s and looking at developing cars which used hovercraft systems as a replacement for wheels. So, in 
So, we have these things around for a while. And, well, Christopher Cockrell, a British mechanical engineer, also works on it. And also develops, and it's usually the one regarded as really pushing these things. He'd been born in June 1910 and died in June 1999, but his efforts really did push along the development of hovercraft. But imagine if these had been available in World War II. Think about it. Think about the US Marine Corps island campaign. If you've got hovercraft, think about the range of beaches that suddenly become possible for D-Day. Because there are beaches which landing craft will dig in on, but hovercraft won't because they float up them, drop people off and then float away. Think about the sandbars, etc., which they can ignore. Think about how they can be used in Norway. Think about how they could be used in Southeast Asia. Think about what the Germans could have done with working hovercraft based on the other side of the channel. They could have launched their own daring raids on Britain. That wouldn't necessarily have been the best idea, but they could have done. Hovercraft would have had a massive difference on World War II. And would have been really, I have to, I will say this, along with ducks and the old LVTs, they would have been really, really useful for the US Marine Corps in the Pacific. But think about how the other, all sides could have used them, and suddenly you sit there and go... Because... One of the things about hovercraft that's kind of interesting is that in the 1950s there is an explosion in the amount of work done on them and suddenly they almost start appearing from everywhere. And you sit there and go, well where does this technology come from? It's all been developed mostly in the 1930s, then put on ice by World War II and then come about in the 1950s when it's been recovered. And if it had been just a little bit further ahead in its development, so it had been the point at which it could have been implemented and built in something, you would have seen them in World War II. I'm not sure which country would have filled them first. Honestly, it's a toss-up my, in my mind between Finland, Britain, and the United States. Those are the three countries which are really pushing it. But the Soviet Union is also quite far ahead there, and there is the idea which went through my mind, if the Soviet Union got these sort of things, and got hovercraft working first, there might have been some more reverse lend-lease going on, and Soviet hovercraft could have been being sent to, uh, Amer to America or Britain back in the ships to support our forces, and we're sending them trucks. But also, think about it from a Soviet logistics perspective, that might have changed the logistics program completely, because Again, hovercraft don't need proper roads. They're expensive, but if you've got high-value goods you want moved, and you don't have the terrain to support them, and it's essential those goods are moved, suddenly they become very useful. And their access and leaving the sea point, uh, leaving rivers, etc., is just a flattened area of, of basically, of shoreline. Again, it's far more difficult for someone to take out a hovercraft's route than it is a vehicle's or a train's. And then final invention, the Whitehead Torpedo. It comes into existence in 1866 and actually makes torpedoes a practical system. Now, the moment I mention this, and I have discussed this as a concept before, if it had come in earlier, it would have been part of the US Civil War. People immediately turn to the South as a rule, and go, oh, yeah, but the, could the Confederates really have used it? I'm not sure. 
if they have the industrial capacity to actually build them, let alone use them. They have some capacity, and they can certainly buy some stuff in from abroad, but I don't think they can. But it's not the South which really interests me, it's the North. Because, you see, the North goes the route of the monitors, etc., to counter the armoured vessels of the South. But if you have Whitehead torpedoes, well, bye-bye Merrimack. Bye-bye pretty much anything that you want to take out uh, comes up to you. Yes, you might not be in an armoured ship, but you lop off a few of these, you manage to launch a few torpedoes. Yes, they might have a low state hitting chance, but it's far easier to mass produce these than it is to produce armoured ships. Mass produced armoured ships. You can build this in a factory. A ship needs a shipyard, and then it needs to be launched and fitted out, and all sorts of different components are put in. This one, you can train one good crew, one good factory, and churn them out. It suddenly changes the scenario for those blockading squadrons dramatically. It also makes it quite likely that at some point the United States produces the torpedo battleship, but we'll leave that to one side. Look, just because I am flicking history around to make the torpedo battleship more likely doesn't make me a bad person. It just makes me interested in the idea as a concept and hoping against hope that the Royal Navy wouldn't follow suit, because I can see endless problems with the idea of a torpedo battleship, even though I think it is a rather cool thing, I just don't think it'd be that effective, but I think it'd be cool. That's the thing. There are lots of things that are cool, which aren't that effective. My model railways. Cool. Effective for entertainment. To replace the actual railway system in the UK, probably more reliable, but I doubt they'd pull, uh, pull as much load. Them's the brakes. <sighs> but no. Whitehead Torpedo. Just too late. And so really the initial version doesn't get used much. And it gets evolved and evolved and evolved and developed. And eventually becomes a far more capable system. But. For a while. A little bit earlier could have made a big difference to it. A big difference to the world as well. Right, what have we got coming up? Um, oh, good lord. Very near the end. Very near the end of this series of all these videos. Let's see. We've done 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36, 38. It'll be 38, 40 by the end. And I think I might have started a bit early as well, if I remember correctly. There, I think I have been doing a long patrol, a long recorded video, and a short every single day for, ooh, is it 48 days? I'm not sure. I, I, I would, I, I honestly... I honestly am not sure. I, I, I have to go quite a long way back to find days when I don't have two videos a day. Um, I've got back as far as the 25th of November. Since then, I have been putting up an air a video every single day. So, November went to 30 days. So that'll be 45 days in a row I'll have done two videos a day. I hope you've enjoyed them all. I know I have. Um, I won't be doing the same thing next year. In that what I will do, if I do do videos all that time, I think I'll ask for suggestions from January onwards, 
and I already start recording them from January onwards, so I don't have such of a worry of will I get them all done, will they get processed in time, will they get sorted out by the computer system in time. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I know I have, and thank you. And I'd love to hear, of course, the obvious questions for both this and the top five inventions that came too early are what are your top five inventions that came too late or too early, and what did you think of my five? What impact do you think that I've had? Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Take care, and have a nice evening.